Greetings fellow learners. In this video, we are going to look at inception networks. The what, the why, and the how. So let's get to it, starting with the what. So in 2014, the inception model was trained on object recognition. That is, this network would take in an image and it would output the object category of this image. And GoogleNet, which was an incarnation of this inception model, was the competition winner in 2014. And specifically, it was the competition of the ImageNet. This is a big deal, and hence we are learning about it. But why exactly does the GoogleNet or like inception networks look like this? And what I mean by that specifically is like if we if we zoom in, we have like the normal convolution activation pooling layers in the front, but then you have a bunch of these convolution layers that go in parallel that fan out and fan in continuously, these little repeated blocks that happen. Then you have like these, you know, auxiliary nodes that come over here every now and then. And then you can terminate it as softmax. So why exactly do we have this structure at all? We're going to talk about that. So let's talk about that thought process here. So we have an object recognition neural network. We want to build one that takes in an image and outputs an object category. And, you know, one way that we could do this is like AlexNet, which is a good baseline state of the art. But how do we improve performance over this? A classic way to do this is to increase the size of this network. That is increase the number of layers or the number of neurons per layer. And another network that came around this time was VGGNet, and they did it quite successfully creating deep convolution networks using only three cross three convolutions, as opposed to much larger convolutions like the 11 cross 11 that we would see in Alexen. And hence they were able to make an effectively deep structure that could perform almost as good as this inception model too. But increased network size comes with certain issues. First, increased size, implies increased parameters, and this means the network can overfit. And this is particularly true if there is like lack of availability of data and labels. And the second is that the number of computation operations can scale rapidly, making training and inference on the network less and less feasible. So how do we solve for this? Now, these two, you know, the increase in parameters and also scaling of computation operations, which is like multiplications and additions. Now, this happens because of dense layers. So when I say like dense, if we have like a tensor that is in the convolution network that looks like this, it means that most of the values in this tensor are non-zero and hence it's dense. And we usually make the assumption that tensors are dense for neural networks. And this is why we apply like multiplication operations between matrices, taking the sum of products across every single individual parameter because they're non-zero and hence we believe that they have some information. But is this assumption really valid? So researchers at Google challenged this with a hypothesis. And they stated that the optimal neural network that maps an image to a classification is a very sparse one as opposed to dense. This uh, hypothesis didn't really come out of thin air and it's kind of based on some of these three points. First, there was some theoretical backing from previous research that came out like the previous year. And then there's biological merit. Neurons in the brain are sparsely connected. So we have like 10 to the power of 11 neurons that are connected with 10 to the power of 15 synapses, making it very sparse. And then the third is potential efficiency. Sparsity implies less parameters, which implies less overfitting and computation. So that has its own benefits. But the problem here is that we can't really train sparse networks directly. And this is because CPUs and GPUs as they have evolved today are very efficient at dense operations and dense computations uh, and not really sparse computations. So we wanna make use of the hardware that exists today for dense computations. And hence the practical solution is to approximate the sparse computations using smaller parallel dense computations. So let's take a look at this. 
So in the very base case, in a convolution neural network, the fundamental operation is convolution. So let's say that we have like a feature map, you know, that's 32 cross 32 cross 256, that we want to transform into another 32 cross 32 cross 256 tensor. So this is like a big feature transformation that we want to perform. And if we perform this, you know, naively with like the normal like 5 cross 5 convolution, that means that let's say that we need 5 cross 5 cross 256, that's the size of one filter, which we slide on this tensor, uh, take the sum of all products there, and then we'll get like a single value. Then we slide this tensor across the entire thing, and we'll get a 32 cross 32 output here. And we need 256 of these filters in order to get this final output over here. Now the number of parameters that would be incurred in this case would be 5 times 5 times 256 times 256, which is the number of out channels. This 256 is the number of in channels. And hence, we end up with 1.638 million learnable parameters. So keep this in mind as like the base case. Now, many of the output 256 channels here may be highly correlated and hence passing similar information forward into the network. So now one way to kind of use sparse connections or approximate sparse connections, like we said, is to use parallel dense connections. So let's say now we, we perform convolutions in parallel in this way. So let's just say in this one cost one convolution, we want to output a 32 cross 32 cross 64 channels over here. This is 128 channels for the three cross three, 32 for the five cross five, and 32 for the max pooling. And this can be done with, you know, in this case, it's one cross one cross like 256. That's like one filter. We slide over the entire tensor to get a 32 cross 32. And then you have 64 said of those in order to get this full thing here. And similarly, you can see how we can get these other tensors as well. Next, all we do is stack all of these tensors based on the channels here. So you just add the channel depth and that becomes 256 right over here where, you know, the yellows correspond to, this is the output of the result of, you know, one cross one convolutions. These blues are the three cross three, the red is five cross five, and henceforth. So we're effectively able to perform this transformation uh, with these parallel convolutions. And while these channels are more correlated and redundant within this same color, they are less correlated between other colors over here too. And hence we are simulating some sense of sparsity. So the number of parameters in this case, if we do like some sort of computations, you'll see that, you know, in this one cross one case, it's one times one times 256 input channels times 64 output channels plus three times three times 256 input channels times 28 output channels, plus five times five times 256 input channels times 32 output channels, plus max pooling doesn't add any learnable parameters, so I just explicitly write it as zero here. And you'll see now that there's 516,000 learnable parameters. This is three times less than the previous case or the naive case, which is great but we can actually make the transformations even more efficient. And we can do this by introducing this network, which basically adds a one cross one or pointwise convolutions. And they are used to control the depth of the channels. Um, I explained a lot more detail of this in another video, which I will link in the description below. So please do check that out. Ultimately, what you need to know here is the reason we use one cross one convolutions is to control the channel depth so that, you know, 256 is a lot of channels. And if you apply five cross five directly onto it, it's going to create a lot more parameters, a little bit too many of them. And hence, we use pointwise convolutions to like as a bottleneck, we'll scale it down to like 16 channels. And then on the 16, we will operate this much more if expensive convolution operation. The same thing with, you know, this three cross two convolution, instead of operating directly on 256, we first scale it down to 96 channels and then we operate on it. And everything here is kind of remaining the same. Now though, if you try to determine the number of learnable parameters and you do all the math, you will see that there's only 176 learnable parameters. This is almost like nine times lower than the original naive case. 
So you can see how we can still perform the feature transformation far more effectively with this simulated sparse network operation. And this right here is exactly what we call the inception block. And all we need to do now is we concatenate these blocks one after the other, and we get the inception network. And so this is kind of like what you see over here. We have like one inception block, another inception block, another inception block. And here you can see that we have an inception block and there's this auxiliary nodes over here that go to a softmax and same over here. The reason we do this is because like this, now because of this sparsity, we are able to make the network parameter efficient and hence it becomes very deep. But if, because networks are too deep, you get the vanishing gradient problem if you try to back propagate just directly from here. Uh, the gradients might vanish and these earlier neurons may not learn, hence they become dead. So to prevent that, we can actually pass in the label right over here too, at different points within the network. And we would, you know, some of these, like this convolution would get now gradients propagating from the original case and gradients propagating from this branch over here. And so this branch uh, gradient would be weighted by like a small discount instead, like it'd be like 0 0.3. And that's how we ensure that the neurons just don't die in this very deep network. So overall, I hope the why behind like this architecture actually now makes more sense. Now let's kind of look at the how with some code. So in this code, we are actually going to train the like one iteration of the inception net on the Cypher 10 data set. So Cypher 10 is basically a classification data set. You give it an image, it'll classify into like 10 object categories. And the model architecture, well, first we have like the inception block that we kind of just talked about. And then we have the inception network that we're gonna use, which is only going to have three of those inception blocks that we mentioned here, here, and here, just because this data set is a little smaller. And, you know, comparing this to like Alex in terms of parameters, you can see AlexNet has 2.2 million parameters, whereas this inception net has nine times fewer, only 270,000 parameters. And yet when we actually train this network, we get like a best accuracy of like 80%. And, you know, in a previous video on the exact same data set for the exact number of epochs, we trained an Alex and architecture and observed almost like the same accuracy. So essentially, even though we had like nine times less parameters, we're getting like the same performance. So you can imagine if we just scale this inception net a little bit more with a few more parameters, we can easily cross this performance too. And so this is kind of like why inception also became quite big and popular in 2014. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Which of the following is true about inception networks? A, it uses multi-scale filters in parallel to capture both fine and coarse features. B, it reduces parameters by using one cross one convolutions. C, it avoids fully connected layers entirely. Or D, it introduces residual connections for deeper training. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct options are A and B. Did you get them right? Please comment your reasoning down in the comments below and let's have a discussion. And at this point, if you think I deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's gonna do it for quiz time, but before we go, let's generate a summary. So in this video, we took a look at the inception model that was trained on object recognition. Given an object, it outputs an object category. And this was actually the top network in 2014 in the ImageNet competition. We then took a look at exactly like why the inception architecture kind of looks like this. And this is largely because of a hypothesis that was made that the optimal neural network would be a very sparse one. However, in practice, we could only use dense connections because that's what GPUs and CPUs are optimized for. And hence we approximate sparsity using these dense connections.
We then took a look at how parameter efficient this inception block can be and how we thought of creating it. And then just by taking this inception block, stacking them, we can get the entire inception network. We also took a look at the code for ImageNet and saw that despite the 9x less number of parameters, training for the same time on the same parameter configurations, this inception network also got very similar accuracy to AlexNet. And so you can imagine if you train this a little bit more, you can get even better performance. So that's all I have for you today. If you want to check out all the resources, the research done, the papers used, you can check it out in the description below. And also this code will be there as well. And if you think I deserve it, once again, please do consider giving this video a like, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.